Well, we thank you for joining us today. And, you know, we've had so many great opportunities to meet authors from all across the country. And Lisa Rice is here with us today, and she has written another book called For Parents Only. Welcome, Lisa. Thank you. Thanks for having me. And you're from the great city of Atlanta, That's Georgia. That's right. We hot love Atlanta. it up there. Yeah, almost as hot as Orlando. Almost. We're getting there. Not quite as humid as Orlando, no, though. That's right. Now, this, that's... how many books is this for you? This is number four. And then number five is coming out really soon called For Young Men Only, for the Teenage Boys. So that kind of rounds out our series here. Now I have to tell you, I've read your two other books, The Four Women Only and Four Men Only, yes. and they are incredible because, and, and they're fresh yeah. information. I mean, because you've really taken the time to interview people and to get your surveys and get it all together and you really go straight to the heart of the matter of things. Is this book going to be the same way for parents? I hope so. You know, it's all the same um, same type of survey related books, all of them. My writing partner Shanti Feldhahn has a background from Wall Street and Harvard and this was her background is doing this heavy analysis. So all the books are the same sort of methodology where we go in and we do focus groups and then we go to the person on the street in the mall and then we take what we've learned and we do a big expensive professional scientific national survey and so all the books basically have about a thousand people that have input into them. Okay tell me some of the most shocking things in doing your your surveys that you found out that kids because you do that in your book you'll put right. what the what we think the kids are thinking which God That's help right. us with that yeah. and then what they're actually thinking which yeah. I think is so powerful because sometimes yeah. we don't know how to get into our kids. That's true. So tell me what was some of the most shocking things you think you learned. Well, the first one was this whole thing. You know, a lot of t a lot of surveys have done been done recently. A lot of people ask the question, you know, who has the most influence on a kid? Is it parents or peers? But we found that it's actually neither. Really? It's actually this addictive thing called freedom. The quest for freedom is the greatest influence on a kid. Um, and you know, we. For example, we were talking with some kids in a focus group and she was this one girl was telling us a story about going to a school dance and she said all these people were doing this kind of dirty dancing thing. I don't know if you've seen how high school kids do this thing now. It's just awful. But she and a Christian friend were together, and the one girl wanted to go do this dancing. And she knew her parents wouldn't want her to be up there. And her Christian friend next to her was saying, don't get up there. So her friend didn't want her to, but because she wanted to exercise her own freedom, that was the highest motivator. She was going to do what she wanted to do. And a huge thing we found is that the children do not have scientific um, evidence has just come out right in the middle of writing this book that shows that the frontal lobe of the brain is not even finished developing until a kid is somewhere around 23, 24, or 25. I've actually seen that before. Have you? I have. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it explains a lot, doesn't it? Does. It does. <laughs> so they have this thing that's not developed, and that is that is the, the area that processes consequences and does risk assessment. And so if that's not developed, they rely on the next center back, which is the center for emotion and impulse. So that's why we're getting a lot of the behaviors that's that the we're seeing. Fun part of life. I know. Isn't that crazy? <laughs> so we as parents just automatically say it's an evil, rebellious heart. Yes. Well, the kids we interviewed said, no, it's really just this quest for freedom. We're mm -hmm. we're good kids. Yeah, 90% of kids call themselves good kids. Mm -hmm. But you know, I wonder if that hasn't, I know we're not doctors, but I wonder if that hasn't developed because it hasn't been pushed to be developed. Yeah. You know, you just wonder all of that because there is some kids who are making great decisions and who are, That's you know, true. there are kids that are doing it. So tell me, what do you think motivates our kids the most? Is it just the freedom? It or is, is this it mad quest for freedom. It really is. They are, um, they're motivated to just go for it, to do what they want to do, to stay with who they want to stay, to drive as fast as they want to drive. And so as a parent's responsibility, we're telling parents, this is your opportunity to be that external frontal lobe for your child, mm -hmm. to say, you know, what will this mean? If you go to the mall with Susie, what will this mean for the homework that you need to get done? And when you made plans to go to this party, did you realize who all was going to be there? Did you know that it was the drinkers that were going to come? How could we have prevented what happened? Or, you know, just to kind of talk through and be that external external frontal lobe. Those teenage years can be very dangerous for yeah. kids too. I mean, you hear traffic accidents, you hear yeah. all kinds of crazy things that, that uh, teenagers will do sometimes. So yeah. that's part of it too, trying right. to realize that uh, that has not developed and, 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 and also 
of course, parenting is probably the most wonderful experience we'll ever share in our lives. That's true. It's a privilege. Of a good, good marriage, you know. Yeah. But um, but it has the most rewards too. That's true. Of it raising really up does. children that uh, have become, first of all, Christians, but also that they they're good kids and they they have a good head on their shoulders. That's true. But what I think is powerful is she talks about in this book is for parents to really start being parents to sit down mm. and talk with your children. That's right. I think that is that something that you really hit on in this book is what? to really become good listeners. That's it. it. And what what we found on that on that note is that when kids say you don't mm. listen to me, you don't listen to me, what we're, what they're really saying is that you're not hearing the emotion. You're not mm. hearing what I'm really saying. You know, as parents, we tend to sort of go for the fix. You know, um, our child will come home and say, you know, oh my gosh, the teacher did this and that in front of everybody, I'm, you know, and they're starting to tell this big story. Well, my old reaction used to be, oh, what is that teacher's email? I'm just going to get on this. You know, and that's not what my child is wanting. My child is wanting me to say, oh, I bet that made you feel embarrassed. What are, you know, and to really kind of get into the emotion of the thing and to affirm that and to tell some of my own stories. And then, and then, all of that emotion, when that's diffused, then we can go for a fix. And see, why I think that's so powerful is, to me, one of the most important things about being a parent is taking the time to slow down in my busyness of life. Oh, that's so and true. And to put myself in their shoes. Yeah. I mean, it's like when I go to my husband, I'm not looking for him to solve all my problems. Yes. <laughs> I'm looking for, sometimes, just for some empathy. That's Just right. to let me know I'm not alone. Let me air it out. I think our kids are sometimes looking for that, too. That's exactly right. And sometimes, right. to almost challenge our children to... Yeah. How do you think we could have handled it or, or ask them the questions that yeah. make them start thinking? You know, that's what parenting, that, I like that you say that, is getting them to begin to think. That's right. To learn how to deal with their emotions. That's right. And that really takes the busy parent having time to just take the kid on a little date, yeah. a parent date. Because sometimes in the house they really won't open up. you got to say, hey, let's go. Do you have 20 minutes? Can I take you to Starbucks? Let me go get you a shake at Sonic. And then when you're out. Just ask the good probing questions. You know, do you feel included in this family? How about at school? You know, do you, and ask open-ended questions. So what's going on? What are your goals? You know, who are your friends now? And just kind of ask the good questions that often we don't have time to ask. It has to be intentional. It really does. And it doesn't matter their age. No. I mean, right. I have a six-year-old that he comes home and we have a time every night because he's not oh, a big talker. You know, yeah. Some kids are not big talkers. Yeah. You talk about that. But at nighttime, he'll open up and it might be a 10-minute window. That's right. And I don't miss that moment yes. to make sure that I get and can ask him, how was your school today? You know, do kids play with you today? It's those little things because kids won't talk. They don't. But That's right. Digging and it's, it out. And you're doing the exact right thing. In our last chapter, I we talk books. about. Oh, good. <laughs> <laughs> That's very good. We talk about the differences in the sexes. And with a boy, like you have your boy, and I have a 13-year-old boy, even at 13, he likes me to go and rub his back at night. And oh. I ask the same question I always did. Tell me one good thing and one bad thing about your day. And with yes. a boy, you don't want to do eye-to-eye -eye contact because they take it as too confrontational. You know, with a girl, you do. You oh, want to look into that. her eyes. Yeah. So that's why a boy will pour it all out. Mm -hmm. If you're just not, you know, if it's in the dark and you're just rubbing his back, all of a sudden he'll pour out because it's a, it's the difference in the sexes. It's mm -hmm. just a more safe thing for him to have sort of a parallel thing rather than an eye-to-eye -eye confrontational thing. I'm so glad you just told me that. If you had to name one overwhelming need that kids have today, what would it be? Just to have their parents be intentional, to have the time and the ear of mom and dad. They definitely talked about, you know, just they, the very last thing we asked the kids was this. If you only had one day left with your parents, what's the big thing that you would want them to know? And, you know, we had heard all this other stuff from these rebel, you know, rebellious sounding kids about attitudes and kind of some mean sounding things. But then at the very end, the responses just poured in overwhelmingly. I would want to tell my parents how much I love them, how sorry I am for all the stuff I've done, and how much that I want to be just like them when I grow up. So, I mean, that is the thing that can hold our hearts secure is that no matter what prickliness or attitudes that we're feeling right now, dedicate your child to God, hang in there, and realize that his ability to accomplish his purpose in our kids' lives far outweighs our ability to goof it all up. Mm. Lisa, I wish we had more time to talk about this book, but also your other books. Uh, and again, this is called For Parents Only, and if you'd like to get more...